Nostalgia is overrated. Change my mind. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Let's talk about 5th edition, or rather, let's talk about what it promised to be. When his playtest version, D&D Next, was announced, the developers specifically called it a uniting of the editions. The fact that the final product only played list serves to this unification served to frustrate me, as I've gone over many times. I bring that up here because, much like with Godbound, if you fail to deliver, someone's inevitably going to step up in your place. In this case, two people. Enter Jonathan Tweet and Rob Heinso, the lead developers of D&D 3rd and 4th edition respectively. Taking their ideas from the respective editions, they teamed up with artists Lee Moyer and Aaron McConnell to create 13th Age, a unification of 4th edition's detailed encounters and 3rd edition's depth and customization, along with some narrative elements common in the indie tabletop scene. The idea was to create a D&D without the fat, or excessive compromise. And then, a challenger appears. Enter Unity, a crowdfunded RPG by Zensara Studios by way of Anson Tran and Astra Crompton. Unity had been on my radar to review for some time, along with 13th Age. While I had originally planned on reviewing these two separately, upon further digging, I'd realized the two have more in common than it first appeared. I don't know if the latter cited the former as inspiration, but as Zensara said yes to that, I believe it. Which brings us to the present. We have two RPGs that take notes from narrativist games, as well as older editions of D&D. Does one rise while the other one falls? Do the two bleed too much into each other? Well, let's find out. We'll start with 13th Age. Much like the game itself, its visual style is a halfway between the magazine style of 4th edition and the tome-like appearance of 3rd. A couple things in the writing style that drew my attention were the myriad sidebars from the dev team giving advice and perspective, most of which presents a consistent set of viewpoints with neither side implied to be correct. It gives off an impression that this is a game they've played fairly frequently at their own table, house ruling it as appropriate. It's also very GM accommodating for the writing, which is a refreshing change of pace and attitude compared to other games. That said, there is an implicit assumption that the GM picking this up has some degree of familiarity with D&D. Obviously, that's not going to be a problem for me, but if your D&D experience is rooted in the streamer bubble I've talked about beforehand, this might cause a bit of a culture shock. Unity, on the other hand, has a visual style that in a weird way reminds me of a mix of D&D 4th Edition and the Cypher system from Monty Cook. The book's use of sidebars, multiple colors to draw attention, and almost comic-esque artwork definitely adds to its visual identity. This is far more of a self-contained game that's closely tied to its setting, as opposed to being a malleable system. What certainly helps matters are the generous amounts of flavor text ranging from short stories to the descriptions of various powers. It has the same kind of visual identity I talked about in my reviews of Exalted and Godbound, wherein the images presented are deeply tied to the setting present. Best of all, both have an index. Good stuff all around. Classes in 13th Age are less thematic of an affair than those of Unity's, so finding common ground will be an exercise of feel more than anything else. In this case, our sample character, Devin Talix, will be themed around a newly minted religious knight, with some filled-in bits reflecting that theme. We'll start with 13th Age. While the race and class picks here will be human and paladin respectively, we'll get to that shortly. First, ability scores. Much like we've done in the past, we'll opt for the roll method, in this case 46 and drop the lowest. In our case, we rolled and assigned the following results. 18 Strength, 16 Constitution, 13 Dexterity, 14 Intelligence, 12 Wisdom, and 17 Charisma. As a human, we can increase one ability by two. In this case, we're going to go with Constitution. As a Paladin, we can increase Strength or Charisma, which would be the latter in this case. As usual, ability modifiers for the score in question are minus 10 and then halved. 13th Age adds the character's level to this modifier, making the final modifiers to be Strength 5, Con 4, Dex 2, Int 3, Wisdom 2, and Charisma 5. In addition, since we picked Human as our race, we can start with two Adventurer tier feats instead of one. We also gain the Quick to Fight racial power, which lets us roll initiative twice and choose the result we prefer. As a Paladin, we gain the Smite Evil class feature and three Paladin's Talents in which case we're going to go with Cleric Training, Divine Domain, and Bastion. 
Cleric Training lets us use one first level Cleric spell, which we'll use for Hammer of Faith. In a similar vein, Divine Domain grants us a Cleric Domain talent, in which case we'll go with Sun. As mentioned before, we have two feats to choose from. Here we'll go with Bastion and Smite Evil's Adventurer feats, the former granting an additional recovery and the latter granting a plus four bonus to Smite attacks. This, along with his equipment, makes his defenses to be 18 armor class, 14 physical defense, and 15 mental defense. Following that is equipment. We'll be starting with a halberd, longsword, half-plate armor, shield, adventuring gear, a prayer book, a holy symbol, and 25 GP. Next is icon relationships. Icons are 13th Age's replacement of the alignment system, kind of. The icons being the major powers within the game's setting. At first level, you gain three points to spend on positive, negative, or conflicted relationship. In our case, we'll go with two points towards the Priestess and one point towards Emperor. The former is a positive relationship, while the latter is a conflicted one. Finally, backgrounds. Backgrounds are the closest thing this game has to skills. They're added at ability score checks when they're deemed appropriate to a role. At first level, you gain eight points to spend on backgrounds, and no more than five points can be spent on a single background. In this case, we'll go with Bodyguard 5 and Heretic Hunter 3. Character creation in 13th Age is pretty fast and loose, with some classes being faster than others, obviously. I have a mixed attitude about some of the classes feeling like half waypoints based on their talents, but I'm not entirely sure how I feel about the mix of per day and at will powers here. Either way, the game demonstrates how to use the various character seeds without sacrificing complexity. Unity's character creation is similar in some ways, but different in others. Regardless, we'll be going with the same character and concept. First is race, which determines the baseline attributes as well as granting a racial ability. In our case, we went with human, which is a baseline of one in all four attributes. Might, agility, mind, and presence. Additionally, we have the tenacious ability. This allows us to reroll any roll and choose the result we prefer, but only once per full rest. Secondly, we distribute attributes which are either rolled as a set of d10s or chosen from two options. In our case, we rolled a 7, 10, 5, and an 8. After assigning those results, we get Might 3, Agility 1, Mind 2, and Presence 2. Third is Class. The classes in Unity are more setting appropriate than they are in 13th Age, so we'll be going with the closest approximation in Judge. This grants us the Zealot and Holy Smite class features, one class perk, and three Tier 1 powers. For our perk, we'll go with Insightful, and for powers, we'll go with Radiant Strike, Righteous Defense, and To the Ends of the Earth. Fourth is Core Paths. While it's written somewhat differently, for all intents and purposes, it's similar to the backgrounds in 13th Age. In Unity, you create three Core Paths and distribute five points between them. In our case, we'll go with two in Bodyguard, two in Heretic Hunter, and one in Mercenary. Finally, Equipment. Unity de-emphasizes elaborate inventory lists in other games, and instead boils it down to your gear and necessities. In both cases, you have a set number of maximum charges for these based on your might score. In our case, we have 5 necessity charges and 9 gear necessity charges. The former consists of items like your tents, bedrolls, rations, and so on, while the latter consists of items you might find in Adventurer's Pack, like torches and rope. Beyond that, we start with 250 denarum, which we'll spend on necessities and gear up to our max, a halberd, plate mail, and a health potion. Character creation in Unity is fairly simple, and again reminds me of Cypher in a way that I can't quite put into words, with a little bit of 4th edition's writing quirks as well. I do have a mixed opinion on the way the game generates attributes, and the detail with describing core paths is significantly inadequate compared to 13th Age's backgrounds. One nitpick I do have is how certain derived stats are organized, but that's more of a consequence of how I prefer character creation chapters. I like them to be self-contained. Thirteenth Age, being designed as a combination of 3rd and 4th edition, uses a lot of elements familiar to both. It's still using a d20 system, the ability scores are the same, and so on, but there's some aspects that stand out. Races are similar to how they were handled in 4th edition, providing an ability bonus and racial powers. In the same vein, abilities and other stats receive gradual bonuses based on level, appropriate due to 13th Age only having 10 levels as opposed to 4th edition's 30. 13th Age also carries over the ability to recover health without using potions from 4th edition. Known as recoveries in this case, these are rolled instead of being a flat number. 
you roll a number of die based on your class and level and add your constitution modifier. Most characters will have 8 recoveries per day, but there are ways to expand this. Using them in combat is treated as a rally and can only be done once per encounter for free. Subsequent rallies require a flat roll of 11 or higher. Combat has a simple sense of action economy, having 4th edition's mix of standard, move, and quick actions, with an option of stepping downward. Its most interesting aspect is the Escalation die, which represents a momentum mechanic. From the second round onward, player characters and certain NPCs gain a gradual plus one bonus to attacks, up to a maximum of plus six. More importantly, several classes, talents, feats, and so on can grant additional effects based on the Escalation die, adding more powerful options the longer combat goes. Classes are based around two or three pillars. Features, talents, and in some cases, powers. Features and talents are the most important, with the latter being significant for choices for a given playstyle, some of which allows the class to dip into other classes' abilities, while features are more set in stone. Powers are the catch-all for spells, maneuvers, and similar effects, typically based on odd-numbered levels. Even with that, several of the classes do something unique, and that's something I'll get into later on. Feats, on the other hand, are mostly rooted in the aforementioned pillars. While there are a handful of general feats available, many of the feats in the book are rooted in powers, features, and talents. Directly, actually. Furthermore, most of these feats follow the game's three-tier setup. Adventure at levels 1 through 4, Champion at levels 5 through 7, and Epic at levels 8 through 10. This is my only real critique. Given that a character will have 10 feats at most, 11 for humans, I think that's far too few to do the strict tiered approach. I'd be more willing to deal with it if there were 20 levels, but that's not the case. 13th Age might come off a bit narrativist in some of its mechanics, and the lack of certain standout spells are probably going to be a point of contention for some. This doubly applies to its lack of skills, though I would counter with the fact that D&D has never really been designed with a skill system in mind like some other games are. Personally, I think there's a decent amount of crunch without overdoing it. I don't care for the f strict feet tiering, as I mentioned before, but that's something easily house-ruled, and hell, I've done just that. Unlike 13th Age, Unity uses a 2d10 system. Furthermore, it takes a cue from D&D 5th Edition with its implementation of benefit and hindrance, similar to advantage and disadvantage, but not as spiky. In this case, you roll 3d10 and discard the lowest or highest die, respectively. Unity does have something loosely resembling an extra effort mechanic in spark points. This is a shared pool between the players, and points are typically accumulated by the GM's call. When hitting a certain threshold, they can be spent by a player to gain a moment of glory, which grants benefit to their next roll. The thresholds for both may vary, but a solid baseline is a maximum of 12, with 4 points generating a moment. Unity also has 10 levels per class, but how they're handled is slightly different. For starters, each class will typically have two or more features and one starting perk, the game's equivalent to feats, and powers are divided between Tier 1 and Tier 2. At certain levels, you can choose to either gain a new power or apply an upgrade to one you currently have. Unlike 13th Age, powers are not relegated to at-will, encounter, and daily charges. Instead, each class has a resource they draw on for their powers and features. This resource is recharged by rolling doubles on attack or defense rolls. When that happens, you can roll that class's resource die and gain that many points back. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Unity doesn't have much in the way of static defenses. Attacks and defenses are rolled, with armor merely providing damage reduction. To that end, rolling double tens triples damage instead of doubling it. Alternatively, rolling double tens can also allow a player to forego extra damage and instead recharge an overdrive power, Unity's equivalent to dailies. Lastly, I should mention Titan Rigs the fantasy mecha that are the centerpiece of colossal combat systems in the game. Much of it operates the same way as normal combat, but is ruled collaboratively using a success ladder. The results of this are based on the total successes from the party or the GM, up to four successes for the best results. Now a titan rig will have its own stats, HP with its self-explanatory, intuition, the titan's baseline proficiency, power, the titan's equivalent to class resource, and armor value, which works the same way as armor for characters. While titans have varying powers, every titan can reroute power to offense or defense, receiving a bonus to either and a penalty to its opposite. 
In either case, you can only reroute up to their intuition. Unity has a very strong sense of its setting alongside its mechanics, and the ability to recover any power is inspired. That said, its ties to its core setting comes at the cost of customization. I could see the narrative use of equipment management being an issue, but that's a subjective affair. That said, I look forward to seeing custom classes out of this system eventually. Hell, I might make one myself. Before I wrap it up, I feel I should delve a bit into the classes of both games. 13th Age's classes are listed in the book based on ease of use instead of alphabetical. I'll be going through the same format as a result. We'll start with Barbarian. Now, putting aside feats, Barbarians will have their options rooted around their Rage class feature and 3 to 5 talents based on their level. Rage works far simpler than in other D&D equivalents. Raging is a daily effect, and until the end of that encounter where it's activated, you may roll 2d20 on attacks and take the higher result. However, if you hit and both die were 11 or higher, that hit is treated as a critical. After its use, you can roll a flat d20 to attempt to regain the use of rage for that day, so long as you roll a 16 or more. Even with talents, most of your effects are going to be per day or per battle. Barbarians aren't quite the basic attack spammers of 3.x, but they're close. Bards are a long-standing punching bag in fantasy games. While there's many reasons why, the main one I want to focus on here is being a jack-of-all-trades in a game that's going to emphasize specialization in one form or another. In the case of 13th Age, this is not as much due to bards being themed around support, with their two pillars outside of talents. The first of these are Battle Cries, a type of flexible attack that is triggered based on the attack roll's die result. Most Battle Cries will grant a nearby ally a benefit or allow them to take specific actions. The second is Spells and Songs. While spells are fairly self-explanatory, songs have their own quirks to account for. A Bardic Song is composed of an opening and sustained effect, being a continuous effect maintained with a d20 roll. If the roll fails or the Bard opts to end it, the song's final verse its effect takes place. Clerics have heal as their primary feature. Much like in 4th edition, these healing effects often are based around recoveries, instead of set healing amounts. In some cases, the target can spend a recovery without rallying, while others let you use a recovery for free. Cleric spells and talents have their own quirks. In the case of spells, many of them have the choice of being either casted for power, but only on one target, or for broad effect, including multiple targets but with a lesser effect. Talents, on the other hand, are how divine domains are handled in this case. Each domain grants a standard effect and an invocation ability that can be used once per day. The only catch is that the same invocation can't be used more than once by a given side. Fighters, alongside barbarians, tend to fall into the one-trick pony trap in most fantasy games, unless properly optimized. Here, fighters have more recoveries than others at 9 instead of 8. Additionally, it has the threatening feature to penalize enemies that might disengage with you, something familiar to those who played 4th edition. The book gives a bit of detail on how talents are at the core of a build's fighting style, and most of the fighter's abilities are rooted in the flexible attack set of maneuvers. I do like this, but I think there could have been a few more ranged maneuvers. Paladins have the unfortunate reputation of being a victim of the alignment system, an issue thankfully mitigated by the icon system present here, as well as the game not being as stringent on what specific enemies it's meant to be based on. Paladins have Smite Evil as a feature, as mentioned before, and its charges are based around your Charisma score. This class is Talak-centric, much like the Barbarian, but many of these talents allow it to dip a proverbial toe into the Cleric if you wish to, with the remaining talents being rooted in Defense and Summon Support. Rangers, like Paladins, are a kind of in-between class based on their talents, more so than other classes because Rangers don't have any class features. While the Ranger does introduce rules for Animal Companions, it's not assumed that you will have a Companion, but if you go with that, it has a baseline set of stats that level with you. Thankfully, your companions act on your initiative instead of having their own, and the choice of companion determines if it acts before or after you, as well as giving passive benefits to its actions. Rogues, being the traditional skill monkey, requires a slightly different approach here. For starters, they have three class features. Momentum, which is key to most of their powers. Sneak attack, which counts if an enemy is engaged with an ally and Trap Sense, which lets you re-roll the relevant skill check. Momentum is akin to a resource, but far more simplified. Essentially, you either have it, or you don't. Typically, you gain it for making successful attacks, and you lose it if you either waste a turn or if you get hit. Some powers require you to simply have momentum to use them, 
while others require you to spend it. Sorcerer is typically the class for those who like to play fast and loose with spellcasting. While it has access to the wizardry spellbook as if it's two levels lower, there are two features that are key to the sorcerer's casting style. First is Chain, which is a tag on certain spells, acting as the spell's flexible attack. When a spell with Chain is cast with an even roll, you can target another enemy within range. This can be done until you stop rolling even or run out of targets within range. Second, Gather Power. This is a way to boost your spellcasting capacities in a way similar to momentum. When you gather power, you gain a random benefit based on a d6 roll, and can expend this gathered power to deal double damage. However, once you gather power, you either have to maintain it or lose it. Since gathering power is a standard action, holding it is generally not advisable. Beyond that, most of the talents are this game's equivalent to bloodline features seen in other D&D games, albeit with a bit more freedom here. Wizards typically have more spells than sorcerers to make up for the preparation they require. While this is still the case in 13th Age, it's more accurate to say that wizard are more measured spellcasters compared to sorcerers. Now, much like sorcerers, they have several features to take advantage of, but the main one I wish to focus on is cyclic spells. This is a tag similar to chain, but is instead tied to the spell's frequency of use. If a cyclic spell is cast when the escalation die is on an even number, the spell is not expended and can be used again. As for the wizard's talents, while some of them are based on the magic spheres, not all that many are. The rest are reflective of the spellcasting styles outside of it, along with one tribute to the Vancean model without being the Vancean model. Classes in Unity tend to stick to a certain formula. The difference lies in the options available for each one. Since the class names are tied into the setting, expect to hear the phrase rough equivalent to, or some permutation thereof, more than once. The first class is the Dreadnought, who is stylistically not too far removed from a Barbarian or an offense-based fighter. Dreadnoughts use up to 6 points of Fury as their resource, and always have at least 1-3 to three points of Armor Penetration. Cleave, their second feature, is less of the traditional follow-through and more of a multi-target attack. This and its repertoire of powers represents the theme of a melee fighter at home in the thick of it. Driftwalkers are similar to Warlocks in a thematic sense. Much like how a Warlock gains power from making questionable deals, Driftwalkers straddle the line of power at a price. While they have two resources, only the former one, Bile, uses the recharge mechanic, up to 8 points. The latter resource, Blood, refers to them using their HP to power effects. As a result of this and their powers, Driftwalkers are high-risk casters, whose powers are the epitome of a double-edged sword. Fellhunters, a name that's probably causing a few rees over at Blizzard, especially with that art, are Unity's ranged specialists, not unlike rangers. Their resource is up to 6 points of focus, and due to their ability to fire at close range with point-blank shot, as well as their ability to spend focus to give themselves some distance, Fell Hunters are a proactive class, always meant to be a step ahead. Judges, the class of choice for Talix, as we saw before, is most similar to a Paladin. Their resource is up to 6 points of fervor, and they may fulfill offensive or defensive roles. While Holy Smite allows judges to spend fervor on a damage boost, Zealot's effects control the die results for either attack or defense, based on whether they're using a shield. The majority of their powers give the class an offense-defense dichotomy, most of which focus on single targets, meaning they aren't as good in the thick as a dreadnought. Mystics, as the name would imply, fulfill the wizard niche. Their resource is up to 10 points of mana and straddles the line between wizard and sorcerer. In the latter case, their Amplify Magic feature is not too dissimilar to Gather Power, in this case granting a personal benefit and damage boost to your next spell. Despite their large resource pool and recharge die, most of their powers can add up in expense fairly quickly, making it important to not overspend on mana. Phantoms are Unity's rogue equivalent with just a dash of Assassin. Their resource is up to 6 points in Guile, and while Backstab works similar to Sneak Attack from before, the Tumble feature is a unique way of demonstrating their defensive abilities, as it allows you to spend Guile to add to damage reduction when hit. As a result, playing Phantom is a game of balance, since having some Guile in reserve for defense is vital. Priest is Unity's answer to Clerics, though that part was obvious. Priests are the only class in Unity that has its own subclasses in the form of class paths, Chaplain and War Priest. Essentially, it's a question of whether the Priest will prioritize healing or combat. While they both use the healing charge power and resource, their choice in path determines how many charges they have, how much of their primary resource, Faith, they can bring to bear, 
and which additional feature they may get. A chaplain can have up to 10 faith, 4 healing charges, and gains the sacred bolt range attack. Conversely, a war priest only has 6 faith and 3 charges, but can wield heavy weapons and armor as well as gain the holy strike power. To put it another way, chaplains are akin to a white mage in Final Fantasy, while war priests are akin to the traditional D&D cleric. Primalist, Unity's answer to druids, is another two resource class. Unlike the other two resource classes, the primalist pair are closely tied with each other. Primalists have six points of spirit and six points of ferocity. The former is used for their spell-like powers, which generate ferocity, that's used for the primalist aspect powers. Aspects can be thought of as a stance in the sense that only one can be active at a time. Additionally, maintaining an aspect costs one ferocity after the activation turn. Because of this, the primalist is like a druid in theme more than anything else, adding a bit of an interesting gish aspect to it. Sentinel is akin to the more defense-oriented fighters with a dash of commander. Their primary resource is up to six discipline, and with its bastion and vigilance features, the sentinel style operates with the assumption of a weapon and board loadout. The former grants your shield's defense bonus to damage reduction, while the latter forces a marked target to focus on you. Now those who've played Defender classes in 4th edition will certainly be at home here with this one. While I initially said that Unity and 13th Age are similar, that similarity is only to a point. Both of these are stylistically carrying D&D 3rd and 4th edition's DNA, but they do so on different terms. As tempting as it would be to place one over the other, neither one has a true edge. Also, I'd be completely unfair to rate one game that's only a year old with one that's several years old and has a wealth of homebrew, third-party, and official expansions. 13th Age is made with a wealth of narrative and mechanical options and an assumption that the players and the GM will be tweaking it as they f see fit to do so. That said, it's once again made with the assumption that those picking up have a passing understanding of D&D in one form or another. Unity, meanwhile, presents a solid set of mechanics weaved into a setting that's built for the system it presents. However, its raw numbers might be a bit small for some, and the unified advancement might be contentious for a multitude of reasons. Where one zigs, the other zags. Personally, I think if you combined aspects from both, you'd have a pretty interesting game. But since I cannot do that here, the only grade I can give both is strongly recommended. I will note one asterisk in 13th Age's case. If you're able, I highly recommend getting the 13 True Ways expansion alongside the main book, as that one introduces the missing traditional classes as well as a multi-class option. I'll probably have to dedicate a video to 13 True Ways in the future, given all that it adds. Personally, if you end up getting one or both of these games, then I've done my job here. If nothing else, these two games show that unifying the additions and adding narrative elements does not necessitate reducing the mechanical options available. After all, if a video game overemphasizes story, then this experience will ring hollow. Role-playing games are no different.